I knew that I was good at my job. I worked hard. I had, at this point, I had two children that I was looking after. And I was, I've always worked full time. I've always worked hard. But I've also always had to juggle that around my children. And, and I think it occurred to me that actually this I'm not going to get the opportunities that I want, that I think I'm capable of, unless I change something pretty drastic. From GoFounder, it's Business Knobs. Why is it called Business Knobs, you might ask? Well, there might well be a few knobs on the podcast, me being one of them. But what it stands for is Business No Bullshit. This podcast series is all about the trials, tribulations and occasional successes of starting and growing a business without the Hollywood filter. I'm Eddie Whittingham and on today's show I'm joined by Alice Stevenson where we talk openly about resilience. Have you ever been told you couldn't do something? Maybe you're too young, don't have the necessary experience or maybe you just don't look the part. There are so many times people back down against that negative noise, concede that maybe they are too young, maybe they do need to spend more time on the job, and maybe they ought to act a little less, well, like themselves. But I think I've always just had this, almost like this weird, like, just blind belief that if I want to do something, then I will absolutely do it. Alice is the founder of Stevenson Law, her own law firm. Only her route to starting and owning her own law firm wasn't so easy. She's heard all the negativity. She was told she couldn't manage a baby 18, that she couldn't go to university with a one-year-old, she couldn't go to law school with a seven-year-old, and funnily enough, she was even told she'd never be able to start her own law firm. But isn't it funny how sometimes those people that say we can't do something end up being a motivator for us? And not just doing them for the sake of it, but absolutely fucking smashing it. Alice's journey to where she is today is an interesting one. Contrary to how all the adverts on the internet would make you believe, this doesn't happen overnight and you need to be resilient. We joined the conversation where I've just asked Alice to give me the background as to how she got to where she is today. I mean, it's quite a, yeah, I mean, I guess it's quite a long journey, really. So I'll try and be as concise as possible. Um, It's definitely been sort of the last 20 years, I suppose, that have been, I guess, what I would describe as my journey to where I am now. So... I fell pregnant when I was 18 and I was still at school studying my A-levels. Um, it was a super, super difficult time for me. Um, I didn't have any support. I I was homeless for a period. Wow. Um, it, was, it was really, really, really tough. I was determined to finish my A-levels. Um, so I did. I didn't get as good a grades as I would have done otherwise. Um, But I did them and I was seven months pregnant when I took my A-levels. And then I had my daughter Lydia in the August following the exams. Um, And I was really, really determined that I was going to make something of myself. At this point, I had reached out to the local housing authority um, and they had given me accommodation. I was claiming benefits to help, you know, to support us. And I was surrounded by lots of people who were in a very similar situation to me. I was in, effectively, I was living in a council estate. And I was absolutely determined that I was not going to stay there. So I I knew I wanted to go to university. I didn't know what I wanted to study. So I looked at my local university which was Bath University and the courses that were available to me and the courses that I could get on with the A-levels that I had which wasn't you know a huge amount and I applied to do social sciences got got a place started the following year so Lydia was one when I started went off to the student finance office pretty much on my first day and I was like I'm gonna need some help here please um 
I kind of, at the time, I really fell between a lot of gaps because I was too young to be considered an independent student and get the financial support that an independent student would get. Because of my age, um, I was basically told that, well, your parents should be supporting you, so we're not going to give you any help. Um, and my parents weren't supporting me. So I I really didn't, I, I felt a little bit abandoned, I think. I went to the student support office and the lady who ran that, I, she, I mean, she was just brilliant. She did absolutely everything she could do to support me. She she found any you know any additional financial support that I could possibly have been entitled to, she managed to get hold of for me. Um, my daughter went to the campus nursery. I got a part time job, and I just kind of cracked on with it really. Yeah, I'd, yeah. The support was very very thin on the ground, and I was incredibly poor at the time. Um, we were living in this in this small flat on this council estate. Um, we, you know, I had an electricity meter that I, you know, would often struggle to top up when it ran out. Um, and things were really, really, really tough. And I was doing my studying. I was working part time. I was trying to juggle Lydia um, being at nursery and looking after her. Um, and I just kind of just took one day at a time and just got through it. Um, after my first year at university, I decided to transfer my degree to a sociology and HR management degree, which ironically, I wouldn't have actually got on in if I'd applied for that in the first place, because I didn't have the A-levels to get onto the course. But there, there's lots more flexibility than you think when you actually get to university and you can you can sort of switch your courses around slightly um so i did my degree and i finished four years later i had a placement year and i started working in hr in for the nhs um and lydia was at school and it was fine you know we weren't in quite as as bad a difficult situation financially as we had been i was working full time earning a relatively decent salary um, we were kind of, you know, plodding along, not too badly. But after a sort of a couple of years, I just felt really unsatisfied, unfulfilled. Um, I didn't, I, I'd kind of fallen into HR. I'd never made a conscious decision that that's what I really wanted to do. Um, and I just made the decision that actually this isn't really what I want to do. Um, it wasn't making me really happy. So I decided that I wanted to be a lawyer, but was then faced with the really difficult challenge of, well, how was I going to be a lawyer? Because I couldn't afford to give up my job and go back to uni for two years. Um, you know, I was I was supporting Lydia and supporting myself. So my only option was going to be to secure a training contract that was going to sponsor me to go back to university. And with the A-level grades that I had, that was obviously a big challenge because most of the law firms that that sponsor you, that give you that support, they care about what you got for your A-levels. Um, and they don't really care if you've got a good reason why you didn't get those A-levels because they've got enough people to look at who have got those A-levels. So, you know, even though they talk about taking mitigating circumstances into account, I, I don't see a lot of that happening in practice. So I applied for, I mean, I, I was living in Bath, but I applied for Bristol, for University at Bristol, for a training contract in Bristol. And I just made a bit of my a pest to myself, I think, of the, the people who were recruiting. So the people in HR just made sure that they knew who I was. I had an opportunity to explain my A-levels and all of that kind of stuff. And I got invited to one assessment centre at Bon Pierce at the time, the now Womble Bon Dickinson, who was actually, I think, the only firm that I applied to that didn't look at A-levels. Um, 
and I got applied to the, I got invited to the assessment day. I'd, I'd secured my place on the GDL at university. I handed my notice in on my job and I was like literally a week away from starting university thinking if I don't get this, I've got no job and I can't go, I can't pay the fees to go to university. So I was like, my God, the pressure's really on. Like I have got to get this offer. Um, and I went along to the assessment day. God, I was nervous. It was it was one of the most terrifying days of my life, I think. Um, but I managed to pull it out of the bag and they and they made me an offer and I was honestly like just so over the moon. I can even re like remember now receiving that phone call and have stayed in touch with the, you know, with the recruitment person at Bomb Pierce yeah. ever since. Um, because I think, yeah, that was a very special moment. So that was amazing. So I went back to university. Lydia was about seven now at this time. Um, went back to university for two years. Um, it was a lot easier than my first experience at university. Okay. Um, had lots of people sort of saying to me, God, how are you doing this with a, with a little one? And I was like, this is a breeze, mate, honestly. <laughs> <laughs> I've got somebody paying for me Absolutely. to be here. You know, that, you know, that was not <laughs> the case before. So I am one happy buddy. Um, so I did, you know, did my, my, um, GDL and my LPC and started my training contract at Bon Pierce. And and I had a really good time doing my training there. I really enjoyed it. But it was also a really, really shit time to be training as a lawyer because it was in the in the 2009 crash, the recession. Everything was just a little bit rubbish. Jobs were really thin on the ground. And when I finished my training, there weren't any um, there weren't any NQ jobs yeah. available. And actually, during my training contract, I had met my my now husband, um, and I had a baby while I was doing my training contract. So I had I and I really, really didn't want to qualify any later than I already was. I kind of, with hindsight, I think I was in too much of a rush. I think I was, you know, I was twenty nine. I kind of felt like I can't. I'm I'm getting on a bit. Like I'm I've got all these trainees with in their early 20s and I just felt really old and like I was behind yeah. so when I got pregnant I was like I don't want this to slow me down so you can take four months off your training contract um and not delay your qualification so that's what I did I took four months off maternity leave went back to finish my training and then found out that there were no jobs oh, there for me. So obviously, benefit of hindsight and everything, I was like, that was a bit silly, Alice. You, you know, a there was no real rush, um, and and it was it was a bit pointless, really. But that's a lesson learned, I think. But I managed to get another job. And what was it actually like, though? So you've obviously you had a child quite young. Um, I guess against convention of what people normally expect to happen in terms of going to university, when to have children, etc. So presumably that had some sort of negative connotations or people put that as a barrier almost to what you could then go on to achieve. Yeah, definitely. I mean, I was told outright that I wouldn't be able to do it. There's no way I'd be able to go to university with a, with a baby. There was no way that I was going to be able to support myself. Um, yeah, I was told by everybody around me that I was not going to be able to make this work. Um, and I think at the time I just really blocked it out. I was like, it, to me, it wasn't an option to not make it work. I had, I had a baby that I had to look after and I had to support. So, you know, what was I going to do? Um, so, you know, when we're talking about resilience, I think, going through that period of my life made me definitely made me the person that I am today which is somebody who is extremely resilient and it and it was a horrible thing to go through um in a lot of ways quite traumatic um you know I'm not I'm not ashamed to admit that I've had to go through 
quite a lot of therapy to come to terms with some of the things that happened to me. And there's no doubt that I'm still carrying a lot of the scars from the experience. And and a lot of a lot of it has been suppressed quite deeply inside me and I can't remember a lot of it. So I guess that resilience does come at a price. And what do you think it was that maybe made you as resilient as you were? What was sort of your your motivation and and I guess how how did you become so resilient? Um it's a really difficult question to answer actually because I don't really know the answer. I think if I'm being completely honest, I think there was a part of me that almost felt like I hadn't quite proved people wrong, that I needed to take this up another level um, and really show people what I was capable of. And, you know, law is a very credible, well-regarded profession. And I think there was a part of me that thought, if I can do this, if I can make this work, then I can 100% turn around to all those people that said that I, I wouldn't be able to make a life for myself and say, well, look at me now. Now what have you got to say? Um, I don't necessarily think that those that you know that's ever the right reason to do something um i you know i don't i don't now believe in making decisions based on wanting to prove other people wrong i don't think that that's sensible but you know these things do happen yeah i i, I agree i think it's probably not the healthiest of drivers shall we say but I do think it is it can still be a positive driver um I know when uh, I was in the police people thought I was absolutely bonkers for for wanting to leave when I was whatever I was 26 at the time and they were genuinely worried about the pension side of things I was like what are you on about and then equally when I left law uh, I think people's perception of that, that that was probably quite a risky move so I don't think I've been overly driven by um by wanting to prove people wrong yeah but it probably has also played played a part um so i don't necessarily think it, it, it shouldn't be your key driver but i i don't necessarily think it's always a bad driver yeah i think so and i think part of it as well was proving it to myself um as well as as well as the people that were around me and you know how how well, i guess you know what are you capable of and i think and i still really strongly believe and talk about now is that we are all so much capable of we're, we're all more, more capable of what we realize oh gosh my words are in we are all so much capable of more than we realize yeah. we impose limitations on ourselves and other people impose limitations on ourselves and they can have a huge impact on us Massive. and we might not even realize that that's happening to us but i think i've always just had this almost like this weird like just blind belief that if I want to do something then I will absolutely do it yeah and I think it's really interesting that if you look back at people's sort of history you can typically I I think spot relatively early on how not maybe likely they are to be successful but but whether they've almost got that within them so you know you could argue for example in your personal circumstances particularly like say university in very difficult circumstances, like, uh, I guess, financially, and also having commitments outside of your actual university work, you still did, you know, very well to do what you did. Um, and I think a lot of successful people have demonstrated that in their in their past. So I think for people like listening to this, if you're thinking about starting a business, it's good to look back at your, I guess, achievements and see where, where have you gone above and beyond? What have you done that maybe is a good indicator can you can achieve uh, and, and work really hard to do something that maybe isn't the norm because I think most people do have that that in them so you might have you know you got a job quicker than you perhaps ought to have done you might have already had a dabble with making some money on the side but never really gone gone fully into it but typically I think there's always a, a kind of a, a green flag shall we call it um, that indicates people are actually capable of more yeah a hundred percent but I, I do think one of the things that people often uh, 
I don't know, overlook or, or don't re- probably appreciate is that it takes time, doesn't it? It's not these sort of things that I was talking about very briefly. They're not things that are going to happen overnight, are they? You know, it, everything has its own journey and sometimes that journey can take a little while. Absolutely. Um, I mean, yeah, it's been a 20 year, 20 year path for me. And, you know, there's, I'm obviously not at the end of it. Still got a long way to go. Still got lots of things that I want to achieve, both with my business and personally, and who knows what else. I mean, I think one of the things that I get really excited by is that you never know what opportunities around the corner. Definitely. Um, I've never really understood why some people struggle so much with uncertainty like people who are kind of on this career path to partnership and it's like if they deviate from that then then they really struggle with that and for me I mean that's just my 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 worst idea of a nightmare because I don't want to have my life mapped out for me and I don't want to have my my life being controlled by other people I don't so for me, I get really excited by not knowing what's going to happen. And obviously, there's going to be good things and there's going to be bad things. But I mean, the good things you could just be incredible. And that's, I think, really, really exciting. But I think that that's a really important mindset to have if you want to start your own business. Yeah, it's that idea of being comfortable being uncomfortable. I think the life of a business owner is typically you have to be very comfortable in that space of uncertainty, not knowing how much money you're going to be earning, um, not knowing, you know, when to hire, how to hire. All of those questions come into play in terms of when you're starting a business and growing it, um, right the way through to selling it, you know, even when you're going through that sales process, is it possible that I'm going to be able to sell it? Are they going to remain interested in all that? And it, it's a constant state of uncertainty that obviously, you know, you don't get as, a, as an employee, um, that's why employment definitely has a lot of benefits, particularly depending on your personality type, I think. Um, so yeah, I think that's a really good sort of reminder of one of the key aspects of running your own business that you need to be successful. You do need to be comfortable being uncomfortable um, and sort of out of that comfort zone. What, what sort of resilience do you think you've had to display um, throughout your journey? I guess you know you've got you've got the resilience required to run a business which applies to someone like me running a law firm but also applies to anyone else running running their own business and then I guess you've got the additional nuances that are added to that that are sector and industry specific um, which also I think you know require a degree of resilience um, and that's going to be slightly different for different people. So I think, um, you know, a, a male law firm owner is not going to have to deal with all of the exact same challenges that I have to deal with as a female law firm owner. And a black female law firm owner is also going to have additional challenges to deal with than I have to deal with. And I think it's really important to to understand what those are and and so that you can be resilient enough to tackle them. When I when I started my law firm, I was six years qualified. Um, so, you know, in, in lawyer terms, that's actually quite junior. Yeah. Um, and I think because I've always looked a bit younger than I am as well, I definitely encountered a challenge of presenting myself as a credible business owner and a credible solicitor to the types of clients that I wanted to work with. Um, And that's something that you can definitely overcome, but you have to be resilient to be able to do that. And you have to be confident. You have to be able to, you know, approach these clients and confidently explain to them why they should be working with you, despite their reservations that they wouldn't have if they were talking to somebody who was a lot older or who was a man, a lot more experienced and all of those different things. I mean, I think working as a lawyer, ever since I started working as a lawyer, I became increasingly aware of, I guess, the gender biases, the gender inequality that exists within the legal industry. And it's one of the, 
it's one of the key reasons why I'm doing what I'm doing. Um, because I got to, you know, about three years qualified and realised that I didn't want to be a partner. I didn't, I wasn't prepared to do what was required of me to be a partner. I had women of my sort of age and my PQE all around me leaving the industry because they were having children and they didn't want to juggle they didn't want to juggle children with um with their career and I started to really question like what on earth is going on here I knew that I was good at my job I worked hard I had at this point I had two children that I was looking after and I was I've always worked full time I've always worked hard but I've also always had to juggle that around my children. And, and I think it occurred to me that actually this, I'm not going to get the opportunities that I want, that I think I'm capable of, unless I change something pretty drastic. Um, because they, you are very conscious of this, this ceiling that's above your head. And, and what, you know, it's not a meritocratic system. Law firms have rules that say, well, you can't be promoted until you're senior associate, until you're at least five years qualified. It doesn't matter how good you are, you have to tick that box. Or you can't be promoted unless you do this number of billable hours. And you're like, well, I don't have control over the work that I'm given. You're not, you don't let your junior solicitors go out and and bring work in so you've got total control over that um and it made me feel very uncomfortable and for that reason i actually decided to leave law altogether temporarily because wow. <laughs> i just was not comfortable with that environment yeah i think the legal sector is just so archaic isn't it the way it's run the way you have to have so much experience you have to the, the name sometimes often has to fit there's the whole gender bias that you've already mentioned a little bit um already <laughs> with that though you've obviously spent a long time working to get to where you have so to jack it all in that's a, a big old yeah, move so uh, how did that work I, out? I didn't I was very unsuccessfully left law <laughs> because I couldn't think of anything else to do right so um I left quite impulsively after a bad experience where I was working and I handed my notes in and I left. And then I was like, oh, fuck this. I'm not, I'm, I'm done. I'm done with law. I'm not doing this anymore. Um, and my husband at the time was lovely. He was like, you know, didn't put any pressure on me. You know, take some time. Think about what you want to do. So I had a few weeks off and, and it was lovely. And then I was like, what else am I going to do? Like, I don't really, I don't really want to start again. I've worked so hard to get to where I am now and I don't I'm not ready to throw all that away um so I decided to be a consultant so I left employment and started working as a freelance solicitor mostly for in-house legal teams um and that was really eye-opening for me I I enjoyed it a lot more. I enjoyed the freedom and the flexibility, the variety of being able to work for different clients and feeling a lot more in control of what I was doing. And having worked in private practice for five years, I think having that in-house perspective is really, 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 really good and something that I recommend all private practice lawyers do. Yeah, because working as that contractor, it sets you up for having to run your own business effectively. It did, definitely. Because I remember in the very early stages of working as a consultant and you think, God, I don't know where my work next month is going to come from. Like, where's my paycheck going to come from? And that's not something that you have to think about when you're employed. And that was that really stood out to me. And then I was like, well, I've got to make sure yeah. that it comes from somewhere. So you start having to sell yourself. Um, you start having to build a network and explore opportunities. And I learned so much through doing that. And as a lawyer as well, I think, you know, as a consultant lawyer, 
people expect you to pretty much get on with it. Um, they're not going to hold your hand. They're not going to micromanage you. They're not going to babysit you. They're paying you a reasonable amount of money and they expect you to, you know, know, you know your shit. And again, that was quite a shock because I come from a private practice environment where everything was checked. Every email I wrote, everything was checked. And obviously in-house is a totally different ball game. And so is working as a consultant. And I remember like my first week and I was like, who's going to check my emails? Like, no one. The, <laughs> the head of legal and the legal team looked at me. She was like, no one? Just send it. <laughs> Well, that's a really good, another good point to raise though, isn't it? Because you, you go from a position typically in a job where things are checked, everything's got a place and you know where you've got to go through. You've got to go through the approval process before it goes to a client and gets checked by X, Y, and Z. But actually when you start your own business, particularly in law, you know, they're expecting you to know your shit. They're not expecting you to get things wrong. You don't have a sort of safety blanket of someone checking through that. You've just got to get on with it, haven't you? Um, from a from a sort of more personal perspective, like in the law firms that you worked in, given that it is such an archaic sort of sector, really, in my in my opinion, how, how much of an issue was sort of appearance for, for you particularly? Because I know obviously you, you've got your own tattoos and things like that. What, was that an issue? I mean, yes, law firms definitely care about appearance. And I don't think there's anything wrong with caring about appearance. Um but it's how you care about appearance, I think, that really matters. Um, when when I was working in law firms, I didn't have I didn't have the same number of tattoos that I have now. And occasionally, sort of one would sort of creep out underneath the top that I was wearing or something. And and you'd kind of I kind of get like a bit of a bit of a comment that made it very clear to me that. I wasn't in any trouble, but if I was to come in wearing a vest top, for example, that would that would not be okay. So I always felt quite stifled by that, and I always felt like I couldn't I couldn't express myself through my appearance. And the fact that you're almost shamed for having tattoos because they're not they're not seen as well, you know this is a part of you, norm, right? Yeah. So you have to cover it up. And and I think what that does is it makes you feel like there's something to be ashamed of. Like, we, you know, we don't want our clients to see those because they're not going to trust you with doing their legal work if they see your tattoos. Which is bonkers, isn't it? And that can be really bad for your mental health, yeah. to be honest. And it can make you feel pretty shit. And it's the same, like, I'm God, one of the first things I did when I decided that I didn't want to be a lawyer anymore and I had that time off is I went and I dyed my hair pink. Okay. And I'd wanted to dye my hair pink for such a long time. And I was like, I can't do it. I, and I felt so, so oppressed. That I wasn't able to dye my hair pink. As soon as I was given the freedom to do that, I was there. And I hated it and I looked ridiculous. And it didn't stay pink for very long at all. But the fact is that so many people just aren't given the freedom and the freedom to do this, the freedom to express themselves. Yep. And whether somebody's got a tattoo or a nose ring or pink hair That's or whatever it is, it just makes absolutely no Correct. flipping difference. Absolutely. I think, you know, we work with a lot of tech clients and I mean, they love working with us because we look, we look like they do um Normal. exactly um so it works you know i've built a law firm around my personality around my need to to be authentic and around the need my need to express myself and through that i encourage everybody in my team to do the same and that obviously attracts a certain type of clients you know a big institutional yeah, bank is not going to want to work with us. And that's fine. You know, I, I, we're not trying to please everybody. We're not trying to be everything to everyone. I think, and, and I think one of the problems is that that is exactly what law firms do try and do. 
That's not just a problem limited to to the legal sector, though. I, I say that across every yeah. sector, uh, really. People are uh, people are too afraid of turning customers away, almost. So they want to appeal to everybody, but by doing that, mm. they just are really forgettable. Most law firms and their branding are completely forgettable. Same with accountancy practices. We see more sort of daring branding in other areas, but I think people miss the trick by, you know appealing to a niche you don't have to be liked by everybody you just need to be liked by a core enough audience to build a business um and yeah using using your personal brand i think is becoming more popular in it and it and it will continue to and, it, and it's a really big part of business these days yeah i agree and i think there's some really really great business owners out there that do such a great job in expressing their personality their individuality and it's a great way to sell your business and to raise the profile of your business i think i do think that too many business owners still struggle to find that confidence to do that um because it does take is it is quite scary putting yourself out there and this is me and you're going to get people turning around and saying well if that's you then i don't like you um and also, I think when you're starting a business, it takes time before you realize that not, not everybody needs to be your client. Absolutely. Because I think it certainly took me a bit of time of trying to trying to identify the right client for us and that not every piece of work that comes through the door is the right work for us. But when you're in those really early stages it's not that easy and you think that you should just try and do everything yeah, for you, everyone you're desperate and i think you lose a bit of yourself when you do that there's a natural transition i think isn't there from being a employee to a business owner obviously you've gone from being a solicitor then to the owner of your own law firm so how has that been and, and you know how much i guess resilience have you had to show throughout that process and that that transition I mean, my job now is not as a lawyer. So the last few months, I haven't been doing any legal work. I've stepped away from that completely. So my my job is now focused on running the business. Um, so, you know, I'm responsible for setting the, the strategic direction of the business, deciding what we're going to be doing and obviously I've got great people around me to support and help me with that um but ultimately those decisions are on my head and not all of those decisions end up to be the right decisions and you do make mistakes I've made a lot of mistakes in the last three and a half years and I feel a massive sense of responsibility to to my family because you know my husband sold his business once Stevenson Law sort of once we saw that Stevenson Law really had the potential to to be a really successful yeah. business he sold his business and we went all in on Stevenson Law so I feel a massive sense of responsibility to him and to my children to make this work um, I feel a massive sense of responsibility towards my team because they've trusted me with their careers with their jobs with their financial stability and I think the thing that probably keeps me awake the night and most is letting people down yeah totally I know from my experience the feeling of failure the feeling of letting people down both you know partner employees even just onlookers sometimes clients that feeling and that that worry that you're going to let them down was probably my biggest uh, my biggest thing that kept me awake at night. That and cash flow, the obvious one. Um, but it's interesting how the perception of running a business is different to that. I think there's a perception that it's um, often easier. You're not doing a lot of the the legwork because often you know you've got the employees to do some of the the work, and you're taking a more strategic view. But those decisions don't necessarily get any easier. I don't think um, from a strategic point of view, they're sometimes really difficult decisions that you've got to make, um, and and they too, I think, can keep you up at night as well. I think it's hard because w- when you've got that responsibility, obviously you've got to make your business a success. 
so that you don't let everybody down. And to make your business a success, you have to make difficult decisions and you have to make unpopular decisions. Yeah. And I think it's not always apparent why those decisions have to be made because, you know, I'm the only one that knows everything in my head. Um, so, you know, some of the decisions that I've made could be looked at by other people and, and I could be criticized for making those decisions, but I know that that decision was absolutely essential to, to make sure that my business is successful. So, and I'm not complaining about that. You know, I, I wouldn't want everybody in my team to feel the same degree of pressure that I do that, you know, they don't get paid for that. They haven't chosen that. That's just not the way that it should be. But I think, I, I think that's definitely the case as well. There are so many different pressures from being an employee to a business owner. And I think you've highlighted a, a, a good amount there. Um, it's probably a part of being a business owner that people don't speak about the sort of uncomfortable decisions that you have to make and the pressure that you're probably under that you don't necessarily get as an employee but in terms of um anyone listening or watching this who is thinking about starting their own business in whatever sector it might be what would some of your sort of key takeaway advice be for them in, in order to get them in the best possible place they can be to to hopefully have some success so i guess there's a couple of things that i i do and take pretty seriously so i Shortly after starting my business, I stopped drinking alcohol. Um, I realised that it was not helping me. I was, I was using it as a crutch to cope with the stress and pressure of running my business. But actually, it was making it a whole lot worse. I was, you know, I was would have a couple of glasses of wine in the evening to wind down. And I'd wake up and just feel this fog over my head. Um, and I just knew that I had, I just had to stop. So I stopped drinking and I haven't drunk now for nearly three years. Um, and I turned vegan. I took up CrossFit. So instead of waking up with like this horrible foggy head thinking, oh, I really don't want to get out of bed. I was getting up at 5.30 every morning and going to do CrossFit before coming back and doing the school run and getting into work. And I know that to most people that sounds absolutely bonkers. But to me, it made a massive difference to my resilience. Um, you know, I struggle with anxiety a lot. And eating sugar, drinking alcohol, not exercising, all of these things contribute to anxiety. But we use them as a way of self-medicating anxiety. And it and it has the total opposite effect so I think I would definitely definitely recommend anyone who's starting their own business to look at how you're looking after yourself both physically and mentally because if you're in poor physical or mental health then you're really really going to struggle and I think on the mental health side of things I read books I watched TED talks like I just tried to learn from other people who had done this I tried to learn about how I could improve myself and and you know that's a continuous process obviously that's Alice Stevenson the founder of Stevenson Law. I'm not sure there's much better feeling than giving the middle finger to your doubters. Now, of course, that shouldn't be your only driver, and we're all much more mature than that, but come on, how about that for showing some resistance? So maybe you're thinking about what you'd really like to do, but have your own naysayers. Is it someone holding you back? Is it something? Or perhaps it's just yourself. I mentioned it in the podcast, but one thing I think successful people tend to have in common is a track record of overachievement. And I don't mean that in the sort of way that you got A stars in your GCSEs. What I mean is overachieving given your circumstances, your background, your upbringing, any external factors. So what is there in your history that tells you that you might have what it takes to start your own business? 
Thanks so much for listening to this episode. You can subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. And you can also find out more about how we're helping businesses get started without the bullshit over at gofounder.com. A special thanks to Alice Stevenson and, of course, to you for listening to Business Knobs from GoFounder.